met John in Recording person. Recording in progress. Um, and uh, that was a joy. Tim was just talking about what a, a help uh, John and um, uh, Rachel, Rachel yes. were when they were visiting here <laughs> uh, with karma yoga and all of that. And, um, you know, Australia is always on our mind and in our hearts. Uh, the leaders there have just been going full blast these past few years, and we, we just so appreciate them. On the other side of the world, you know, I can imagine, so, especially in the beginning, where it just kind of felt like, uh, you know, are we here, you know, just all by ourselves, just us and the masters? Uh, where's our guru guys? Where are the, the souls who are going to help us build this work? And um, it's, it's been a joy to see it just growing and blossoming over these, these past few years. And um, just the visitors that have been able to come, Asha and Keshava and Dumbara and it's just uh, Australia's a, a great joy to tune into. And um, as Kalamali said, Tim and I uh, do live and serve here at the village, and uh, we are um, we're, we're bhakti yogis, but we're also it, it'd be a, a um, you know be harder to figure out bhakti or devotion, which is our leaning more. Uh, we tend to blend both, um, of course, with you know bhakti, jnana, um, karma, uh, yoga. It's all always blended. Uh, but we do love to serve in those ways, and um, we're hoping that our, our fearless leader, Jotish Novak, will be getting a book out uh, sometime soon. He, it's a challenge for him to find time, but maybe during this trip when they were in India, he found time to work on a, a book about the principles of Seva and, and what it really is. You know, it's more than just the, so much more than just the physical aspects of of building community it's it's building inner community with our friends and guru buys um, so I'm gonna stop now because we decided Tim was gonna go first and I'm kind of rushing down the highway <laughs> <laughs> my enthusiasm takes over and uh, he'll talk a little bit and then I'll talk a little bit and then maybe maybe even in addition to questions you all might have things you share in in how um, Seva is manifesting in your lives and, and how you feel that it benefits you and uh, just the different creative ways that you find to share with people, not just in a formal way, but in an informal way. And we'll talk about that more later. So, Hi, welcome. <laughs> nice to see you, John. I was just commenting a minute ago that uh, you and Rachel could come back. The, the chairs in the temple are getting a little out of a line. And, <laughs> We need to straighten them all up again. <laughs> so it's good to see you. Good to see you. Um, yeah, I just start off about Ananda is about service and meditation. It's the two of them. And um, it's the blending together. And I think we tend to lean more on the meditation than the seva, or at least we talk about it more than we do uh, service. So, but it's it's a two leg it's a two legged thing. You can't have one without the other. You need meditation to go along with seva, without a doubt. You can't have just meditation or just seva. You're an incomplete person. You're incomplete. You can't you can't stand on one leg so well, you know. Maybe for a while, but you can't stand on one leg so well. And and it's the same thing. Meditation and and seva have to go together. They have to be part of the same thing or or that's how we work in the world mm -hmm. so um they they just they seem to complement each other so for me i don't know about you guys but i i kind of silo everything and and i know in business we talked about siloing different departments and not being able to talk back and forth and when i go to do something i put on these clothes and i go outside and i work i put on these clothes and i go to church put on these clothes and I go into town. So I silo myself in many different ways. And I think blending the two, meditation and seva, is really important because they both are the same thing, but different, if that makes sense. Both of them take extreme concentration and focus to do. If you're going to do seva correctly and not take it on personally and not 
do it for the gains, not do it for recognition, not do it for any other reason. You have to just concentrate on what you're doing and just let that take you over. Thinking of God, thinking of not the outcome, but just the doing. And I think meditation is best done that way too. If you just sit down and you do your part, you sit down, you concentrate, you breathe, you do your technique, and you sit there and concentrate between the point between the eyebrows that this is when meditations fly by. This is when my meditations just seem to an hour's gone and what happened? You know, I don't know if you guys experience that so much, but I, it's a joy when that kind of meditation happens to me. And the same thing with work. When I'm working on a project that I love, when I'm working on a project that it's a hobby and not something I have to get done, I'm just doing it, that all of a sudden Lisa will say, it's time to come in. I've been out here for hours <laughs> and I haven't even noticed the time go by. And this and this is this is the same thing we want to bring into our seva because it's only when we're thinking about ourselves that the time goes by slowly. When you're at work watching that clock tick, tick, <laughs> tick as the day goes by, you're thinking more of not what you're doing in the moment, but when do I get to leave? When does the whistle blow? And I think we could bring seva into our workplace even and just concentrate on the doing and not on the paycheck not on trying to get out out the door not trying to please the boss not trying to to climb the ladder just do a good job in the moment and just give it all up when you're done and just concentrate on doing the job as well as you can um, Work will just fly by if we can do that. It did. I don't work so much anymore. I now I now work at the temple, which is which is kind of a save a job, and um, I'm lucky that way. But I, I did have 35 years in the work environment, so I'm not a too much of a stranger to it, and I know that um, it can be pretty drudging pr so, so much. And I siloed that. I never really. I can't say that I was ever successful bringing karma yogi seva into my workplace and um i think that would be one of the hardest challenges you could do for yourself to see if you couldn't bring that into your work environment and just do it for the doing sake and not for the reward sake so um that's another part of me siloing off my my life i just seem to work better when i silo as a small chunk type of thing but we got to keep meditation and seva. We kind of kind of look at them as, as two parts. We need to do both. So we'll bring seva into our meditation. Okay, let's 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 say this. If you worked, if you're working, if you're doing your job, if you're doing it and you're not attached to what you're doing, you're not, not nothing in it for yourself. You're just I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, and the time goes by and you're doing it, and you're used to to doing it that way. When you go in your meditation, instead of sitting down and going, oh, did I turn off the water? Did I, uh, did I need to make a list? Boy, I really did that well or didn't do that well. Or when I get done here, I want to do that. If you just were used to doing the task at hand and you sat down for meditation and you just concentrated right away and got to work, and 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 made that the practice if you do your work like that and you bring that same work mentality into your meditation it'll it'll help you begin and take over your meditation and the two will be the same you sit down you go to work and you concentrate on it you sit down and you meditate and you concentrate on it because the worst habit in the world you can get into is sitting down and going over your day going over to your calendar for what you need to do the rest of the week and frittered away. Oh, I'm going to be meditating for two hours. It doesn't really matter if I sit and think about things for the first hour. I still have two hours. Well, those habits, they, they, they can run deep.
they can run real deep. And once everybody knows, once a habit gets ingrained, it's one heck of a job to get that thing out. And so it's it's best if we when we're starting out, if we just get used to sitting down and diving in right away and just concentrating, doing what we need to do, whatever meditation technique you, you know, and sit there and, and meditate and not not fool around. And the same thing with your work or seva. Just get in there, start working, you know, and, and just settle down and concentrate on the task at hand. I'm going to read something I, um, from the essence of the Bhagavad Gita. It's a little bit about the difference between renunciation and um, karma yoga. But um, it's from chapter 31, You Shall Attain Me, which I think is a great, a great title for it. 18.1, Arjuna said, I desire, O mighty arm Krishna, slayer of the demon of ignorance, Keshi, to know the truth meaning of sanasa, renunciation, also tiagi, self-surrender, and the distinction between the two. So that's something we're talking about. What's the difference between being a total renunciant and a tiagi? And, and Master says here in the commentary, Arjuna asks, how can I tell the difference between renunciation and karma yogi? The essence of which is renunciation to the fruit of actions. So this is the question that, that Arjuna was able to present to Krishna. Great question. So in 18.2, the Blessed Lord said, The wise understand renunciation to be the relinquishing of any action performed with personal desire. They also declare that it is not the action itself which should be abandoned, but only the action which desires the fruit of the action. So, Master says here in the commentary, Krishna is saying, act, but don't consider yourself the doer of the act. No one, he has explained, can abandon action. To breathe, sleep, eat, perform the necessary functions of the body must be classified under the general term action. No one, therefore, can renounce action altogether unless he is so spiritually advanced that he can sit the whole day in breathless ecstasy. A possibility for very few. And um, not me. But he does go on to say, the important thing then is to give up the sense of personal doership. Everything the renunciate does should be done with the thought, God is doing this through me. That's what a renunciate says. The Tiagi, on the other hand, may have to involve themselves in somewhat in personal activities. They have spouse, job, family, social responsibilities, but for themselves, they must desire nothing from any activity. This is the true meaning of a karma yogi, and certainly is not substantially different from the path of outer renunciation, except insofar as if one need not attend to such outward duties, they are certainly freer to pursue the path of giving their life to God alone and finding it easier to free their ego from limiting attachment. So that is the difference between the Annunciation and Tiagi or Karma Yogan. But then I love, so I think that's pretty self-explanatory. So the last paragraph, is lest anyone think his easier way indicates a path requiring less courage it'd be well to point out that the path to god takes all the courage and strength one possesses only someone very foolish would choose the more difficult path simply to show others and perhaps also himself that he possesses these two qualities in full measure Tantra is the approach to God that teaches one to be strong in oneself in the very teeth of temptation. It is the back staircase to God and spirituality, spiritually, sorry, 
very dangerous. Far wiser is one who saves his strength instead for the strenuous task in every sense, in any case, a supreme task of climbing up the front staircase of right action, meditation, and renunciations of both the thought of doer and the desire for any personal gain of doing. So I think that that sums up what I was trying to say is that we, as people living in this world and not in the Himalayas on a mountaintop meditating all day, this is this is the path that we have chosen. This is the path that's in front of us. And we have to do our best with what has been giving us. And it is a tough path. But I think through these teachings, through Lahiri Mahashai going up and talking to Babaji and and being a and asking, hey, can I bring these teachings down to regular people, to Tiagis, you know, that this was this was such a blessing, unbelievable blessing, unbelievable blessing that was heaped on us, that he he made that choice and that it was agreed to that he can come down and give us these teachings at all. And so here we are trying to do the best we can, trying to meditate and help and do seva and work in, work in this world and try not, trying to give up day after day the self of we are the doer, that we want to benefit from this. It, it's, it's so hard. But truth be told, I'm baking cookies today and, you know, and I'm going to bring them into Sunday service. And, you know, a thought in my mind goes, you know, it'd be nice if somebody said thank you or that they enjoyed them. Bang, <laughs> you know, right away. Since I was get, thinking of this, I'm going, even that, even that is really a wrong attitude. I should just give them with no thought of anything. But here I am being sucked back into the delusion, back into the Maya, back into... You know, thinking that I actually baked those cookies and that um, I'm going to be giving them to the people at the temple and um, that I should have some sort of recognition for that. So yeah. it is so tough because it creeps into so many places into our lives. And even thought is important. Even thought is important. So, you know, a long time ago, people thought birds just kind of flew. They didn't realize there was air. They had no idea there was air. Birds just went through the sky. You know, nobody thought of why. Nowadays, I think people think thoughts aren't important. But thoughts count. What you think counts. It's just as important as what you do or say is your thoughts. And so, um, as Tiagis, we have to watch that and give that up to God. When we meditate... We can meditate as hard as we can, but if we come out of meditation and go, all I did was run through a to-do list. All I did was think about what I did yesterday. All I did was, what am I going to say to this person? That's okay, because God's the one that's doing the meditation. I'm just doing the best I can, and this is all I could do today, and tomorrow I'll do better. But God essentially would be responsible responsible for the meditation because he's the doer he's the one that did it he's the one that's doing it so when we go into our meditation we need to sit down and immediately get to work and then let god take over let god do what you have to do and then whatever happens happens but we've done our part to the best of our ability so um I think that's all I wanted to say. Um, karma Yogi, when we do Karma Yogi and we're doing Karma Yogi, it's not really to please God. We're not doing Karma Yoga to please God. When you're when you're doing it and you're really into it, I know, I know, I don't know the rest of you, but I know John from being here and working with him and you get done and you're really happy and you're uplifted from the service and you think, wow, that was a lot of fun, even though I was digging a ditch, it was still a lot of fun. Um, 
it's it's because the soul is uplifted so you're doing you're doing this the karma yogi not for yourself but for your soul for your higher self because karma yogi can dispel karma you can get rid of past karma with with karma yogi with selfless service with being a, being a seva and that that is really important to understand that that you've reduced car if you do if you do save it correctly you reduce the karma that'll come back to you just like a meditation will benefits are the same so you can reduce that by true being a true karma yogi and um, i think i just want to leave with that point um and yeah seva and meditation are one thing they are the same thing they just have two legs they, that it stands on and one is meditation and one is seva but we, the way we approach them can be the same and i think we can get a lot of benefit from both if we can do it that way thank you so I'll just uh, say a few words now. Um, try not to go over like I did last time so we can hear from all of you. <laughs> Get down that enthusiastic highway of talking about these um, principles that are just so important as part of our path. And Swamiji talked very much about what we, what we really need in, our, in our, our seva is energy. We need to build up the energy to do what we want to do, to serve God to the highest way that we can, to bring everything forth in serving with each other. And, you know, it's, it's not something that just happens. We, we kind of go down that runway and we take off and we do the practices. We do the, the things that we need to do to get that energy going and to build on that energy. And one of the wonderful things about community is that we have other people there to add to that ball of energy and then we all do it together and so that's really really um really important to remember is um it's the energy it it has to start with our energy it has to start with our attitude and how we're approaching our seva i did want to read this um brief excerpt that swami said on uh i forget exactly where i found it something it's about bringing harmony to the earth it says he says Whatever you do, see your work as service to your fellow human beings. If we concentrate on how our work benefits others, it becomes karma yoga, selfless service. Feel that God is playing your part and the parts of those being served. And I think this is really, really important to remember in our everyday lives. As Tim was alluding to, it, it doesn't matter what we're doing. It doesn't matter what the moment brings us to do to serve. And everybody, no matter what you're doing, no matter what your work is in the world, it can become your seva. It's all about the attitude with which we bring to the moment. We can be emptying trash cans. We can be writing programs for computers. We can be working as an environmentalist in you know South America. We can be washing dishes in a kitchen in a restaurant in New York. It really doesn't matter. We can bring God into the situation and see the higher aspects of what we're doing and that becomes our karma yoga. We're washing those dishes so that people can be served, so that the whole restaurant moves smoothly and flawlessly. We're part of a chain of, of serving. The environmentalist is impacting the entire world, Im impacting whatever part of that uh, seva is theirs. Maybe they're saving the chimpanzees. Maybe they're saving the rainforest. Maybe their job is just to document what's going on. Karma seva selfless service every single thing nothing is um, exempt from this um, one of my favorite sevas I didn't get a, a chance to allude to this and I always like to talk about the cows at the dairy where I worked when it was here this was the second dairy and uh, it wasn't something I was looking to do because I was afraid of cows um, but um, there was about, at the time I started, there were two cows and one of the gentlemen who lives here wanted to start a dairy farm for us as had been here in the 70s. And I, as I say, I was afraid of cows 
and but I thought well he you know he must be really desperate if he's asking me there's people here who are younger who are more fit who <laughs> have a lot more experience probably in these areas and so I couldn't say no and and, and that's one of my <laughs> my little uh, hitches in my saying yes is I always so oh they must be desperate if they're asking me to do this so I say yes whether it's wise or not <laughs> so I said okay well <laughs> I'll, I'll try for a couple weeks. I'll see if I can get over this fear of these cows. And one of them was especially intimidating. And uh, at the end of two weeks, I said, well, I'm not over it, but I think I can work toward that. And I said, and I will commit to being at the dairy for a year. I, I felt like, you know, it was a lot to train me, you know, and it was, it's, a you know, like any job, you know, if you have to go looking for someone else. So I wanted him to know that, I'm going to commit to this, um, and I'm going to say that I'll, I'll stay for a year. I ended up staying for a year and a half, and this was not a, a glamorous job. <laughs> I was out there early in the morning, even in the snow here. and But the job was such that after about 10 minutes there, I didn't feel that cold anymore. I was working. I was scooping up the other end of the cow's business and tossing it over the fences. And I didn't need a job. Oh, sorry. Nobody ever calls in the afternoon. There we go. It's off now. And um, <laughs> and just um, milking them. It wasn't hand milking, fortunately, because I don't have strong hands. But there's a machine. And feeding them and doing all the things that you need to do with running a, a dairy. And I had many adventures. I... Um, I got to know this fearsome cow and she was actually very sweet. I got to, um, you know, bottle feed new cows who grew up to charge me and step on me and be mean to me. I, I don't know what that was all about. Um, you know, I'd, I'd been um, stepped on, charged, kicked. And, you know, I'm just in this little corner of Ananda Village and there wasn't, nobody's around, you know, and it wasn't glamorous at all, but... You know, when I would stop and pause, it really felt like such a, a wonderful seva, serving people. You know, this milk went out to people here, and, and it was helping the person who ran it to earn a living. He had a family, and it was just so many aspects of it. Um, another, like so many people here at the village, I've had many different jobs. I'm, I'm sort of addressing the less glamorous ones. You know, it's not all about, oh, the temple of light and making it beautiful, which is absolutely wonderful mm -hmm. and fun. And you get to meet a lot of people and serve dynamically in that way. But I also did um, a lot of the lawn mowing down at the village center. Get on the lawn mower and go. And it was so meditative and so wonderful and so peaceful. And I just felt, you know, people are coming to the village and they're seeing this this is one of the first things they see is how the lawns look you know and you know just i would just be out there with the masters it was just by myself get out there early in the mornings again an early morning job before the sun got hot and uh tim would bring me something to drink and you know at some point and i'd hydrate and there are just so many different ways that we serve i've worked in offices um i i've you know we all have different ways every single thing we do in every moment an official job or not, you know, taking taking soup to someone who's sick, um, picking someone up and taking them to a doctor's appointment, having tea with someone. It's a constant service of our time and our energy and our attention. Every moment is, and I think I alluded to this in the last satsang, there's never a moment when we're not really having the opportunity to be a karma yogi or having the opportunity to be a bhakti yogi or a jnana yogi you know we can we can have our devotion in every single minute we can have our karma yoga in every single minute you know the baking the cookies you know offering that all up to god and saying thank you that i'm able to you know offer this to my friends and here mm -hmm. at, at i mean their faces light up and it's you know the cookies are nice but it's the energy it's the friendship and building these friendships building these connections that's how we build community it's not as swamiji so often said ananda is not a physical place it's an energy it's a it's an inner community and that's what we come for we come to drink of these teachings and drink of the energy and help each other
Um, being a friend to all is so important as part of this path. So very important. And you don't have to be an official minister or light bearer or nigh swamp. Those are just titles. They really mean nothing. Absolutely nothing. When you take those vows, and we've taken some of them ourselves, it's really about you and the vow and the promise to God. And you do it in a public way, yes, but that's just for witnesses of what you're aiming to do in your life and for the loving support of your guru bhais and friends. It's in and of itself, though, it means nothing. It's what you do with that title. And in and of itself, it doesn't matter whether you have a title or not. We all have a different dharma. We all serve in different ways. Some people are ministers. Some people are not. Some people are musicians. Some people are not. I mean, there's just so many ways. Whoever we are is absolutely perfect in our expression of building community and being with each other. It's so important to remember that, that it, we, we are on our path and doing our Dharma and that's the most important thing is the attitude and the energy we give to that and just joyfully serving in every moment. Um, a, a wonderful example of this, um, I love this book, there's books I bring out around the holidays that um, I read at that particular time, and maybe many of you have read this. I'm sure some of you have, because Master talks about this book. It's the practice of the presence of God, and it's not showing forward, up because forward. of our forward. No, it's not doing it. Anyway, no. by Brother Lawrence. He was a 16th century Carmel Carmelite monk in France. And um, he, you know, we, we know his famous, um, many of us, his famous quotes, you know, in the noise and clatter of my kitchen, I felt, um, what's the exact, uh, let's see if I marked the exact quote, because it's so beautiful. Um, anyway, he felt the presence of God as completely as if he was on his knees before the Holy Sacrament. Now you hear that, and it's really beautiful, and we think, if I, I want that. I want to hear God and feel his presence no matter what's going on around me, no matter what's before me. But what you might not know if you don't read uh, this book, and, and it uh, has a, a eulogy to him and a brief bio on him and then his letters and his conversations, is that he loathed being in the kitchen. He did not like that at <laughs> all. You know, he just, of all the things they could have assigned him, that was the, that was one of them. And also he had, to, they sent him to town on business. He said he had no head for business. He apparently, I didn't know this until I read this, um, he had a limp. And so he'd be limping around and trying to do business with the people buying wine for the monastery. But he made it a prayer. He made it an offering. And he said those were some of the most joyous uh, times in his life was being in that kitchen just being with God and constantly constantly praying and yes it's hard to do all the time it's none of us have achieved it perfectly but we can aim toward that and we can forget and we can come back and we can remember and all of this wraps around our general ability to be in tune with the guru to be in tune with our guru and to help each other on this path when one of us makes strides here we're helping the others to make strides. Don't even doubt that for a moment. And when we need help, we know we have the energy and the support of the people who are on the same path as us. And we know how to work through these things. Or at least, if we don't always have an answer right away to learn how to work through the hard times, we at least know the direction to point. And that is to our guru, always referring to him. I don't understand. I don't know what's going on. I will continue to move forward with the best energy I can and you will show me the right way to solve whatever's going on in my life. And sometimes those things are very hard. You know, even with the community around us, a lot of people are going through very hard times right now in the world. But we keep moving forward. We have the assurances that this is this is going to end. We're, ju we're just pointing in the right direction. It's all directional. And um, let me see what else here. Um, oh, there was a um, a story I read by Shivani, a nice one. Shiv 
Shivani and um, Assisi, she talked about when she first came on the path. And she was very new and she saw, you know, what uh, meditation was doing for those around her. So she decided one day she was finally ready to learn how to meditate. So she went to Swamiji's um, dome and she knocked on the door and she hears this sort of weak, come in. And she comes in and he's obviously very sick with the flu. And she starts to back out. I'm sorry, I, I just, uh, I didn't mean to disturb you. And he says, well, why, why are you here? You know, what, you're here, why are you here? And she said she was ready to learn how to meditate. And, and he said, well, it seems that the time is now, so let's do it. And um, so he gave her the, the instructions and I'm sure a lot of beautiful uh, inspiration. And she says, this is the important part. Um, looking back to this moment from a distance of nearly 30 years, I realize more clearly how much I learned that day. Beyond the precious gift of the meditation practice itself, I saw in action an example of selfless service. Kriyananda did not permit his indisposition to hinder the spiritual service he was called upon to render. His response had been unhesitating. The state of his health had not been an obstruction. Now that's not to shame us when the state of our health is an obstruction because that does happen. But so often we can let a little headache or a little sniffle get us off track. And that's what we're trying to move beyond. We're just moving forward as forcefully as we can, but also getting that jnana yoga in there with the wisdom to know what we're doing. And, and that takes practice. And she said, um, she saw something else the way Kriyananda responded to her request on countless other occasions. She said, an attitude that I consider one of the hallmarks of his spiritual legacy, that when the moment is ripe, that is the best time to act. When the moment is right, that is the best time to act. Because those opportunities or moments of inspiration can be so fleeting and they're gone and they may come around again in another form but really tuning in and doing it right then listening to our intuition that's the most important thing and we sharpen our intuition when we meditate when we meditate when we do our hamsa when we do om om is where we really uh, sharpen our intuition um, there's a uh, another story uh, that Davy tells about serving, and it's really also uh, very significant. Uh, one time when um, Swamiji invited a group of them to go over, this was in the 70s, early 70s, to go over to the dome and um, help paint. And so they started sometime in the afternoon. And long story short, because I, you know, I think we could do part three with this if you were interested. <laughs> There I go again. Um, <laughs> um, so they all went over to Swami's dome, and she um, picked doing the the beams up top, you know, that all over. And they just worked and worked and worked. And, you know, can you imagine being like this for hours and hours and hours? And the next thing she, oh, I went out of frame. So <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> like this. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> you know, and the next thing she knows, it's two in the morning. It's like 12, 15, 14 hours later. The time just flew by. Mm -hmm. They were in such joy. You know, being around Swamiji didn't hurt, I'm sure. <laughs> but you know, we can all get to that state with ourselves, with our guru buys. And just, you know, time is such a funny and fluid thing. When we're doing our work, when we're doing our seva, we really don't want time to drag. We really, that's, that's just awful when the time just drags and you're looking at the clock or you're just thinking about other things that you need to do. You've got this long list of things. Um, <laughs> and, but, you know, we don't want it to fly by without us noticing it either. And that's where being in the present moment is so, so valuable. We're just here, we're doing it, and with joy, and you look back, and you're, you don't maybe to remember every little thing you did. You don't remember that you missed your lunch because you were painting like this. You don't remember that other things were going, you're just in that moment and serving beautifully. I'm sure as they were doing it, you know, it was about 
supporting Swamiji and giving back to him for all they were giving, all he was giving to them at that time when he was basically the only person doing the Sunday services and the talks and the yoga. I mean, he gave so much. People were enthusiastic to give back to him. And that's what happens with us also when we, when we support people and magnetize that sort of energy when they see us serving who doesn't want to step into that joy you know people will tune the right people will tune in masters people will tune in true seekers will tune in so as we do this we are serving such a, a broad in a broad way we can't even imagine we can't even always know the ripple effect but we don't need to but the beautiful part is just knowing there's a ripple effect that everything we do counts, that it's important. And when we do it with love, it just puts out an energy that we might not know and we don't need to know. We don't need to know the effect or where it lands. We just know the laws of the universe. When we serve with love, those ripples go out and they touch receptive souls and that buoys them up and they continue the cycle for everyone on the planet. So I'm going to stop here because <laughs> I have so much. And, and I want to see if anybody wants to share or has thoughts or inspirations. Um, and, uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Both so that was really lovely. That was really lovely. And um, I'm just going to do that thing where I mute during the feedback. Um, I, I was wondering, one of the things that you shared was how karma yoga is a form of reducing karma and even how it's yoga union so it's one of the ways that we can find god and i know that's really inspiring for a lot of us and we have some people in some of the kriya yoga courses right now learning about um these paths of, of raja yoga and so if you had any thoughts about that I, I know people would love to hear more i saw a lot of people light up when you were talking about that so let me unmute you sorry Okay, no, that's fine. Um, well, it's it's really mathematical. You know, it is a science and it is an art. And when we serve selflessly, we are burning up karma. We're letting go of attachments. We're letting go of those fetters that have hooked us for so many lifetimes. Because so everyone, you know, we've all had those many, many lifetimes where materialistic things were important to us. And those were the those were the ages that we lived in. And, and that's all, you know, that's all fine. But we're here now. We're moving along to higher ages. We're evolving as souls wanting to get back to spirit. And we just do our very best. I mean, one of the things um, our little ego, our little mind is kind of gets hooked on is it wants to know. It wants to know why it wants to know how what's the end result and in america you know the western world we can especially get hooked on that we're used to doing something to achieve something and and that's all well and good but sometimes we just have to remember that we're not there yet we haven't earned that knowledge you know we'll get there when we get there but in the meantime we just need to do the work with joy and the more we do it with joy, the more joy will happen. Swamiji was so joyful. If anything, he gave us that example. Whatever you're doing, do it with joy. And when we offer it to others, it just, you know, it builds on itself. And, and, the, and it is a scientific path. The only way you're going to know this is to do it and experience it for yourself. I can't um, relay that that beauty you've all I'm sure um, had experiences in your own meditation already that you've you know we've all at least touched the hem of that garment of Samadhi we're, we're moving in that direction we're, we're we may be very far we may be very close we don't know but we've touched what it is to forget ourselves completely even if it's just for a millisecond while we're doing a, a part of our meditation, where we're doing our hongsa, while we're doing our kriya, so I, I hope that answered that. <laughs> I mean, I think you, I think you can also feel it when you do karma yogi, when you when you're helping out doing seva with with a group, especially, <clears throat> and and there and everybody's concentrated on the same task, doing it with the thought of God and not with what because there's nothing in it for you. You're just doing it to weed a garden that's not even yours, and in John's case, not even in his own country. 
so it's it's a it's a real self sacrifice. But but when 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 you're doing work like that and you get done with that work like that, and you have this uplifted feeling like a great meditation. You know, when you come out of it, you walk away and your soul is feeling great because this is this is what Karma Yogi helps out. It's not pleasing God. It's not pleasing the people around you, obviously. And it's for your own soul, for your own upliftment that really you end up doing it. If there's a if there is a selfish reason to do it, just like meditation, you're doing it for your own benefit in a way because you want to get closer to God. Once you tap into that that source, then things become easy. And it's the same with, with Seva, with Karma Yogi. Once you tap into that source, things become easy and you can feel it. You can feel it. Thank you both. That was a really helpful answer. I, uh, I could see a lot of people nodding and uh, we uh so anyone who has a question just type it in the chat just due to sound and i'll read it aloud for you um uh, another thought just as people are uh typing anything in uh you know the relationship between how we are in our day and then when we sit to meditate and uh i thought maybe you could talk a bit about how that relationship with meditation and service how you know, if you serve in the right attitude, how it kind of trans uh, transmits into your meditation. Okay, let me unmute. Well, I think it's an ongoing process of self-forgetfulness. Even in our meditations, we want to forget ourselves and just offer ourselves into those aspects of God that we're resonating with on any particular day, whether it be him as joy or peace or calmness or power, meaning willpower. Um, it all flows. Remember that story when um, uh, Master, if you've read the AY, he was talking about living at the ashram with Sri Yukteswar. And um, Sri Yukteswar would just sit up from sleep and then go right into meditation. You know, it's just one thing just led to another. It was all, the, the day just flowed. And, you know, you feel that when you go to India, the flow of everything just um continuing on um do you have anything you want to no no that that's just about it i mean meditation and seva are the same thing because you're doing the same thing you're concentrating on god and like lisa said not thinking about yourself so this is this is how that how they blend together they're the they're the same person just two legs of the same person. <laughs> so th this is how you want to go into your meditation with a sense of work and concentration. And, and it's important when you sit down to work, I don't know about you, but when I worked, my boss really didn't want me to fool around for the first hour. Really, really was happier if I actually did something. So you bring that, bring that, if nothing else, into your meditation. And when you sit down, immediately get to work and start, start concentrating deeply on the point between the eyebrow, calming yourself first, of course, sitting upright and getting comfortable focusing yourself and then just watching the breath or whatever technique you use and just be and just let God take over and just see what happens. Just see what happens. You can practice that in little ways at home too. You know, when you finish your meditation, you know, we're encouraged to just not get really outward right away. Just do something simple where we can keep that that inwardness and just move through the day that way and during our meditations as we go from one technique to the other just have that inward flow and then we go to work and we have that inward flow and just keep our mind on God all the time no matter if we're at a job answering phones or helping customers see God in every one See him as the one that's approaching you and asking you a question or needing directions. It is all sent from God. All the good, all the ugly, it's all sent and it's all opportunities to remember him and to serve all equally, 
no matter whether they please us or not. And that can be a very tall order, especially when those people who we've had many lifetimes with come up and there they are again. <laughs> you know, they're bothering us again. It's so gosh. Now you're my best friend. In the last life, you were my father. I mean, it's just like, you know, they're going to come. This is what we've asked for, and Master is sending it. I've noticed in my own life, and I, I know I've heard it from others, when we ask for it, he gives it to us. And we do want to ask for it. We want to, we want to be sent the opportunities to be even-minded and cheerful under all circumstances, to see everyone the same and not get in a blip. And we can start practicing that in little ways. I have this habit that I've really been working on. It's a little thing about getting drawn out. And I don't want to say that we should work on every little thing that draws us out, because that can get a little ridiculous. But there are some things that really stand out. And once you work on something, there's sort of a domino effect. So you don't want to go around, oh, I went out because of this. And I went, you don't want to beat on yourself. But sometimes there's a, you know, maybe you have a certain craving for ice cream. It's okay to have the ice cream, but maybe I won't get so excited about it. You know, maybe it's like, yeah, I really appreciate this ice cream, you know. For me, it's dogs. <laughs> and he's laughing because he knows when I see people on the street with dogs, I would always be, can I pet your dog? And, oh, there's a puppy. And I've really worked on reeling that in. Not because in and of itself it's a bad thing, because it, it emphasizes that energy of being outward. You know, and I can appreciate the doggy just walking by and just move on, you know, without making the owner stand there for five mon minutes while we explain change canine kisses you know so you know but there's those little ways that we can work on ourselves to move us in the direction we want to move um, during our work and and it doesn't matter if we blow it we just get up and do it again I, I always emphasize this during sot songs of these sorts I think I did it last time you know what Gyan Amata said at night give everything into his hands you know just offer it all back I, you know, maybe I blew it, but help me to do better tomorrow. Thank you. That was very well put, and I know very inspiring for all of us for how we can continue to take everything that you both have shared today. And we might not have time for every of the uh, one of the questions that has come in, but I'm going to set something up where we can keep answering and also take you up on that part three idea. This is always extremely helpful. Um, but we do have time for I think one more. And um, so this one is from Alexandra. It's a really good question. Actually, my question is to do with maintaining our energy levels when doing Seva with people in a group who um, might have low energy and may not be ready to raise their energy. So how to hold space for the, for the empathy and connection or compassion with those people that are struggling with that? That is an excellent question mm -hmm. because as we know, most of the world does not approach energy the way we do. And it can be, oh, in ever so many ways, a challenge to hold our own in this world against the downward pulling energy. And of course, um, we just do our work we one of the most of course dynamic ways is the energization exercises help us very much in this fashion if we know we're going to be in a group or going to work do the energization exercises before you go they honestly you, you just always feel the difference if you don't have time for that do the super conscious living exercises if you don't have time for that just do a few full yogic breaths and as those pulls come you know, I think a lot of times out of habit, we give attention to things that we don't really want to give attention to. You know, it's it's hard when we're around a group of people like maybe in an office and they're all talking about this or that or the other that's really either maybe not important or maybe gossipy or just a downward pulling energy that's not serving anything. And it brings to mind one of my favorite authors um, who I quote a lot. And this is one of my favorite of his quotes, and it's uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. And he says, the power people have to annoy me, I, I give them with a weak curiosity. 
The power people have to annoy me, I give them with a weak curiosity. Which means we start paying attention. We start listening. You know, if we just hold our own center and we pay attention to what we're doing, you know, and then more and more people around us maybe can get in. You know, sometimes there's someone who walks into a room and everybody stands at attention. It's because their magnetism is so powerful that you just naturally do that. And we can be that person who doesn't allow, in a non-judgmental way, that kind of thing to happen around us. It's, it's, it's very challenging because the world encourages us to do that. And how can you be so unfeeling when you're not getting caught up in this and, you know, you're just, you're just not a loving person because you're not weeping with this or judging this. I mean, it's a really tricky thing to hold your own in the world. It truly is. Joppa. You know, and, and really hold it from a non-judgmental place, too, because they don't know any better. You know, they don't, they're, they're just doing what they're doing, and we're blessed that we don't have to join in on that. Um, we don't want to judge them. They, they have a lot on their plate, and who knows why they're doing what they're doing. Another, and I collect quotes, um, is, um, you know, if, if we could see the secret history of our enemies, I always put enemies in quotes, we would see sorrow and suffering enough to dispel all hostilities. If we could see the secret history of our enemies, we would see sorrow and suffering enough to dispel all hostilities and judgments. And that just doesn't mean in this lifetime, in lifetime after lifetime, and we've all done what they're doing now probably. So we just move on and we hold our own and we give them love and we don't get caught up and we do it in a respectful manner that will earn respect and respond in return yeah there's a saying there but for the grace of god <laughs> go i mm -hmm. and i remember that from my sunday school years but and there it is i mean that 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 could be you if it wasn't for the grace of god and so you just got to look at them with you know, they just don't know any better. Mm -hmm. And that's just the way they are. And we love them and we are an example for them because of our actions. And actions always speak louder than words. Thank you both. Thank that you both. Really that was beautiful uh, sayings for us to end with today and to leave in our hearts and hopefully maintain them throughout the week. And you both have shared beautifully. I feel so inspired. And I'm, I saw John even writing in what an amazing example he saw in you. And um, we've got people adding to that. So just know that we're very grateful. And maybe I could hand it back over to you both to kind of end our satsang today with Ohms. Okay. Yes. And uh, thank you for having us. Uh, we love being with all of you and talk about Australia a lot. Australia is on the mind of many here at the village and yes. what Kalamali and Nara and Bhakti have done there and are doing and so many others. I mean, you really bring joy to our hearts and we're always thrilled to be with you. So let's come together in our energies going within and just um, let's send out some healing prayers because we are so blessed and we have so much to share and let's just bring to mind anyone we know of in need of healing seeing them open to that divine ray look beyond their physical form beyond their personality visualize them as beautiful rays of light with divine mother's vibration flowing through them uninhibitedly, joyfully, always joyfully. Whatever their need is, physical, mental, spiritual, see them open and receptive to their highest good. And let's pray, Divine Mother, thou art omnipresent. Thou art in these thy children. Manifest thy healing light thy love and thy joy in their bodies, minds, and souls. Om. Oh. Um.
Om Shanti 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 Have a beautiful rest of your day there in Australia. You are so deeply in our hearts you don't even know. We really appreciate you. Thank you everyone. Thank you everyone.